Topic for today's message is the blind seas. Okay? How many of you can see? You can all see? Everybody see? How many of you actually have 2020 vision? 2020 vision? Okay, wow, there's a few. 20. After. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. 2020 vision, you know? Uh, everybody's got vision. Yeah, we all got, we got some vision and uh, some kind of vision. Some of us got nearsightedness. Some of us got farsightedness. Some of us got <laughs> bifocal. <laughs> um, but uh, we all have generally healthy eyes. Most of us here. Most of us. Praise the Lord for that. But not everyone in the world has uh, have healthy eyes. You know, not everyone. Um, but with your eyes, what do you want to see? Have you thought about what you want to see with your eyes? Uh, most of us like to see beautiful things. We like to see uh, awesome, amazing things. Um, I want to challenge you to think about what do you want to see? What do you want to see in this world? You know, some of us travel long distances, go to Alaska, the Caribbean, uh, Puerto Rico, you know, or Hawaii, whatever. You know, we, we travel long distances to see things, to experience. And uh, so today, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? What do you want to see in this life? Suppose you're, you're blind. If you're blind if, and uh, you don't have any vision, what, what do you want to see? So for, suppose you're born blind, okay? Ever since you were born, you could never see light. What would you want to see? Think about that. And that's uh, in the story that we're finding in John chapter 9. Could you guys turn to John 9? We're going to be looking at verse 1 through 12. And the topic again is the blind seas. Okay? We're going to look at chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 first. Are you ready? If you have NIV, you can read it with me. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus. As he went along, one more time, everybody together. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, this is a very honest question. Very honest question and is so frequently asked. Um, but of course, we're not so blunt to ask in front of the person. So, so you see a blind person in front of you and say, Rabbi, uh, who sinned? Is this person uh, his parents or him? That's, you know, we're, we're looking at his condition. But isn't it the, the, this gnawing question that we all have when we see some, you know, some kind of condition that, that's not preferable? You know, it, it's not something that anyone would choose to be in that position. Yet when we see something like that, the first inkling, the first reaction is, what happened? Why did this person end up there? I mean, I was on the streets of Shanghai, and, and as you know, it's a, it's a big city. <coughs> it was a, it was an evening, and uh, I went to this one street corner waiting for someone to take me in to, to their service. It was a missional service. So it was a mission, uh, it's kind of a mission gathering of prayer warriors, people pray for mission. So, so as I came, came out of the metro, I, I stood at the corner waiting for them to come and get me, and I see this person right there. And he was on a little platform, some kind of, a, some kind of wood platform uh, somebody made for him. And then he, uh, he had an arm, he had an arm with a hand, and, and this side, his arm was completely cut off from the elbow, and he had no legs, all right, no legs. And uh, he was down skin and bones, and, and I can tell he could not speak. He could not speak. He was just, he was just making gibberish sound, you know. He was, he was doing this, and he was doing this, and he would take, take out this pan, a little pan or a bowl, and, and, and then just, just banging on the ground, expecting people to put change into, into his uh, little bowl. 
And uh, I, was, as I, was, I was standing there, and, and I just, the, the struggle, the struggle goes on. It's like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to give that person some money? What, is this person uh, in this condition because somebody mutilated, mutilated him and, and then put him in this place, and he's part of some kind of, uh, some kind of drug or some kind of gang that's that trying, to, trying to get some sympathy from the people and make money off him? And I'm, I'm, my mind just racing, wondering what's going on. Is the, is the police, well, what does the authority think about the situation? Because for the most part, Shanghai is a pretty contained, you know. Uh, it's a nice city, and it's got a lot of beautiful building, and people dress up nice and so forth. But then right there in that street corner was this, this man. And, and fortunately, I, I didn't have to struggle too long because uh, they finally came out and, and got me, and I went and preached on mission, right? <laughs> But it's not something we struggle with every day. We struggle with. I mean, no, we don't necessarily have the contrast of a, a beautiful, large metropolis like Shanghai, and then right in the center of that, you have a little a, a man who, who's a, 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 a just obvious. He's mutilated somehow, and then he, he he's crippled, and then he he's just out there begging for something. What a contrast of a world. But we think about life, normal life. We, we look at a person's condition. We look at a person's uh, their undesirable features, undesirable conditions. And we look at them and we make some determinations ourselves regularly. And well, why is that person in this condition? Sometimes we ask that question not in the third person perspective. Sometimes we even ask it as a first person perspective. Why am I in this condition why am I in this situation whose fault is it is it my fault somebody's fault is it my parents fault it is a very obvious question it is a legitimate question it's not that the disciples were very insensitive and of course today we call that incorrectly politically you know that's not right to be doing that you want to do it behind his back when he can't hear you right <laughs> we do it anyway we do it in our hearts, in our own quiet of our soul, in the quietness of our soul. We do these kind of, we ask these kind of questions. Why? Whose fault is it? To the Jews 2,000 years ago, they have this philosophy, this is theology, that, that sins passed on from generation to generation. Is that true? Of course it is. Of course it is. But what kind of sin would contribute to someone who is born blind or born mute? or born disabled with some kind of strange disease. What kind of sin would that be? We all know that it's possible because let's say if you have bad temper, right? Somebody has a bad temper, they'll pass on this, this bad temper to the next generation, right? Some bad eating habits, they'll pass it on to the next generation. Somebody say amen to that, right? Right? Obesity can be passed on from generation to generation. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bad eating habits. Um, how about heart disease? Heart disease can be passed on from generation to generation. Genetically, right? Oh, boy. Just uh, too close to home. You know? We, we all know the effects of the previous generation leading us. And poverty can be passed on from generation to generation, too. Right? That's true. That's true. So theologically, we have similar mindset as the Jews did 2,000 years ago. They will look at the situation, this, this is a social economic condition that, that is passed on from generation to generation. There's a spiritual element in that. Okay, there's a physical deformity of this person. This person is disabled by birth. Somebody is at fault. Who's responsible? Is it his sins or his parents' sins? So this question is, is even, even assumes that somehow we can sin without being alive. Do you know that? I mean, this person born blind? I mean, what did he do before he was born? He was in his mom's womb. He was inside the womb and he was sinning already. So this is argues the original sin. A person can't have sin without actually doing anything or make any decision for themselves. Are you with me so far? People argue about these kind of theology and philosophy of life every day. And we make those kind of judgment calls. They say, ah, this person is in this condition because what and what, you know? What happened? 
So who is ultimately responsible for human condition? But by asking this question, we, we often fail to see that we too are in a condition. See, it's so much so easy to be judging others' conditions and, and forget that we ourselves are in some kind of condition ourselves. And is it necessarily more favorable? Do we know that? Because we're all part of the culture of sin. Right? In the story that, uh, that was described in the drama, you know, ever since the creation of man, we, humanity has been in sin. So what do we do? We're in a condition of sin, and therefore, how are we responsible for our own condition? Sometimes we have pity on people. We look down on people. Sometimes we judge them and say they're sinners. Sometimes we, we have very, very little patience for people that are like that. You know, say that with me. That. Okay, and, and that, that could mean a lot of things, right? But why do we want to be associated with that? Ah. So, <laughs> it's not a good place to be when you're born blind. Because you know you have something. Because every time when people talk about something, you just don't know what they're talking about. And they all seem to understand. Seem to understand the reference. But you just don't have it. Everybody's got it, but you don't have it. And no, no, no way for you to imagine what that looks like because you never see anything. All your life, you've been in the dark. All your life, people look pity, pity, pity on you. <clears throat> Pretty soon, you live in that despair, that own <coughs> the condition that men create for you, and you live in that pit because you know you don't measure up. Pretty soon you believe, just like everybody else believes, that somehow you contributed to your own condition. Your parents may have done something wrong. You blame them. Let's go to verse 3. Interesting how Jesus replied. Verse 3, can we read it together? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. One more time. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed on him. You know, when the, the blind men sitting, listening to this dialogue, um, I mean, he was waiting with full anticipation. He, he wanted to know the answer to this question all his life. I want to know. I want to know whose fault it is I'm in this condition. Why am I in such pitiful condition? I want to know. Whose fault is it? You're a holy man. You're a rabbi of some sort. People are asking you. I want to know. I want to know. You know, it's very dangerous. Some, some, of, some of us play. We play the part of a pastor, play the part of a spiritual leader. It's a very dangerous role because what we say sometimes weigh heavily on the heart of some individuals. You know? Well, what if someone you highly respect walk up to you and say, you are worthless? What would that do? What would that do to you? And, and Jesus... The, the traveling rabbi, famous for his mercy and compassion, says these words, as neither this man nor his parents said, I knew it! He echoes in his heart, says, I knew it! It's not me! I didn't do anything to deserve this! My parents didn't do anything for me to deserve, deserve this! I knew it! And his heart just echoes, yes, yes! It's not my sin. I'm not guilty for this. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed on him. So that, so you see, Jesus pointing out something very, very obvious in, in the works of his life, you know. May not be for all of us because a lot of us may not be aware that every condition of man, no matter what condition, Every condition, because we're in the condition of sin, the condition of flawed 
environment, the condition of imperfection requires a display of God. Are you with me? Every condition of man, every condition that is not preferable, every condition that, that is, is just it's, it's a result of sin or a result of imperfection requires, requires a display of God. Are you with me? See, just like, just like the man who was, who was in sin and, and he was struggling in sin as he was, I was bound by, by alcohol, drugs, or whatever, money, and, and all that. And he was struggling and struggling. And we look at that condition, is that, that, that guy is hopeless. I mean, he made some wrong decisions, obviously. Okay? But then what? Every condition of man requires a display of God. Somehow God is going to use it to glorify himself. Somehow, somehow, do we see that? Do we see that in every disability? Do we see that in every inability? Do we see that in every imperfection? That it was meant to display God. Because He is perfect. He is righteous and holy. Sometimes it is true it's because of man's choice. Sometimes too because of the, the mistake of the parents. But every situation requires a display of God. Because God wants to display Himself in every condition. See? Let's look at verse 4 and 5. What does it say? As long as it is day, we must do the works of Him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He says, as long as it is day, we must do. He didn't say, I must do. He said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. See, it's almost as if he's saying, you guys, look, you, you're all disciples of Jesus. You follow me. As I am being sent, you are to do what I do. Are you with me? Whatever I do, you do the same. And in other words, what he's saying is reminding every one of us who follow Jesus, who believes in Jesus Christ, that we have a responsibility in, in every imperfect situation, in every condition of man, that we have a responsibility. What kind of responsibility? To display God. Are you with me so far? We are to display God in every situation. So don't look at a situation say, and just stay in that judgmental spirit or that, that the spirit of discernment maybe. All we do is say, oh, this is good, this is bad. This is, this is preferable, this is not preferable. This is, this is a, a disability, this is not a disability. And we, we stay in that position of judgment instead of we should be engaging in that situation and display Christ. See? Um, earlier, I, I shared with the Chinese congregation that, that we, Helen and I, we've been um, helping out with this situation with the child um, from Valley Christian nearby. And I, I don't think we're going to see her too often. But, but this child has some problem. Okay? Only 14 years old and she's having some problems with her homestay, family is not working out. You know? Um, her, her grades are not that great, but, but she's having some issues at home. I mean, every time we look at a person, look at a child who's having some problems at home, how will we be asking the same question? Who, who's at fault? Maybe that child made some mistakes, you know? Made some wrong choices, made some bad friends, right? Or maybe the parents did some horrible parenting, did some, made some mistakes. Whose fault is it? Or maybe the society, maybe he went, she, she made some wrong friends. Or, or maybe the wrong school she went to, you know, influenced her. Bad teacher, bad pastor, right? We're we looking at all these fingers to point, to identify what and who is at fault. Fault finding, we're very good at fault finding. <laughs> okay, who's at fault? I am. Who's at fault? Because of this mentality, our whole society, every one of us are afraid 
we have this fear to be involved in those people who have problems. Come on, somebody say amen. You, you, you don't want to touch them with a 10-foot pole. You know, this person's got a problem, you stay away from that problem. Okay, you see a disaster, you rather just rubbernecking instead of getting involved. You don't want to touch. Okay, I mean, in, in the same city in Shanghai, there was a little accident. Somebody was taking me to another event. Um, actually, someone kind enough to offer to, uh, to drive me someplace instead of me taking the metro. So I said, great. So we were walking to his car and then halfway there, there was an intersection and this little, this old man, not a little guy, but an older man on his motorcycle and he apparently got uh, knocked over by another vehicle of some sort. It doesn't look like he was hev injured, you know, seriously, but, but he, he, you know, looked like he had a hard time getting up. So the, my first reaction is, you know, I, I had a cup of I think it was Starbucks coffee or something. <laughs> First thing I, I handed over to my friend and said, could you hold this for me? I was ready to go across the street and there was a lot of traffic. Uh, I didn't want him to be run over, right? The, the old man to get run over. So I was just waiting for the traffic and, and he held my hand back and said, no, no, just wait. Just, he's going to be okay. Uh, because here in Shanghai, people can sue you if you help them out. They'll blame you for, you know, for you, for, for, for you be causing the accident if you're the one helping him. You know, the, uh, our society, with its cynicism and its fear to be involved in someone who's in crisis or situation undesirable. Uh, of course, the, the situation didn't turn out that he, he was majorly injured. I mean, he got up and he was able to move away and, you know, drove off with a little motorcycle but what kind of world are we in that we don't engage anymore? Okay, isn't that our calling as Christians? Aren't we called to engage? But we're afraid because we're afraid to touch the undesirable. And sometimes we're so afraid that, that somehow it might infect us. Infect us. That the result of sin can, can come through osmosis. You know, come into our lives. The infection. I think the greatest infection in our society today is the infection of apathy. We don't care anymore. We don't care. People don't care about what's going on around us. And Christians don't even realize we have a sense of responsibility. We should have a sense of responsibility in situations like this. A man begging because he's born blind. What are we to do? I don't know. I struggle. I mean, I, I think the struggle is real and, and, and the struggle somehow comforts me a bit even though I didn't do a thing in situations. Sometimes I don't do a thing, but I believe there's str struggles necessary. And if we don't struggle, I think we fail to realize that there is a sense of responsibility, you know. So he's reminding the disciples, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Isn't that the statement of every Christian? While there is light, I am, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen? Somebody say amen. Tell the person next to you, say, I am the light of the world. That's right, I am. That's right, you are. All right, let's look at the, uh, I, I think this is the word, the action is taking place, and this is very exciting. I, I love, love action in the Bible, all right? Let's look at verse 6 and 7. After saying this, everybody read to me, with me. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the men's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This, this word means sent. So the men went and washed and came home seeing. Now, of course, there's a few emphasis when people go through these passages. Number one is, he came home seeing. Right? That's exciting. Miracle happened. He was blind, he washed, and he seen. Of course, why was he, was he able to see? Because he actually believed. He went and he was sent, and he believed, and he got healed. Wow, what a miracle. But another part I think people often overlook is the method the method of this 
obscure miracle. All right? Jesus spat on the ground. He spit on the ground and with his saliva, mix it with mud, with sand, created a little mud patty. You guys like mud patty? Yeah, little kids love that. <laughs> okay, create a little mud, mud patty and then put it in somebody's eyes. Could you imagine just your hand with saliva and this, this sand, mud, put it in somebody's eyes and yeah, hey, hey, Trisha, yeah. <laughs> happy, happy moment, wow. This is uh, what happy moments are made of, right? Just, ah, yeah, so good. You know, what, what, what's this all about? What is this all about? Why, why did Jesus use such obscure way to minister to this person? He could have just said, be healed. And that person falls over. Ah, and then you can see, right? Why not? Why not? But why did he spit on the ground? Would you imagine with me? Someone was born blind. All right? Born blind. When you're blind, what heightens your other senses sense of what hearing sense of smell sense of touch but see as a man who sits on the ground on a regular basis because if you walk like everybody else you're gonna run into things I don't think they advanced the technology of canes back then but they, they may have a little stick walking stick you know but assuming you're 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 not you know not able to move around because you're blind therefore you're on the ground a lot of, a lot of times and you're, you're there begging begging for some food or money whatever and uh, 2,000 years ago with their theology of righteousness in sin seeing a person with that kind of deformity or that uh, you know blindness right away they equate that with sin and for a Jew, see a sinful person, they declare that they want nothing to do with that. Are you with me so far? You say, I don't want anything to do with you because you're a sinner. Get away from me. I don't want your infection. Get close to me. So people usually walk around sinners. And as they walk around to show their disgust towards sin, they would what? They will spit. They will spit on the ground. And sometimes when, for, for, for people who, who are more disgusted with a person's sin, they even spit on their face. Spit on their face. So for a, a blind beggar born this way, he's used to people spitting on his face. He's used to people making this sound. He's used to it. He's accustomed to hearing this. But see, I want you to understand this internal struggle that is inside this man. As he had his high hopes up when Jesus said, No, it's not this man nor his parents sin, but, but that God's work must be displayed in this person's life. You see that, right? His, his hope was high, but then all of a sudden, Jesus performed this thing that he's so accustomed to hear. Such demeaning, such shameful, such painful experience when Jesus on the ground his heart sank could it be that he's just like everybody else he said all those things theologically maybe he's right but you know what he still hated me he hates me just like everybody else I'm a symbol of sin and wretched I am you know, he's looking at that. Do you know, do you know every miracle is a gut-wrenching experience? Do you understand what I'm saying? Every miracle is a gut-wrenching experience because somehow the person who is experiencing the miracle has that struggle. Can I believe? Is it possible? Is it possible that I might be able to stand? Is it possible that I might be healed? Is it possible? Could this pain go away? Could this pain go away? I, I don't want to believe in something that is only a temporary cure. It's just something, some kind of emotional high. I really want to believe in something that is real and tangible. 
You know, that's a kind of gut-wrenching experience someone who is experiencing healing has to go through. So the person on the ground, he hears Jesus. <sighs> His heart cries. This holy man of God looks at me just like everyone else. And Jesus, as he was taking his time making that mud putty with his saliva, he was taking that which brings shame, disrepute, agony, suffering in the heart of a man, and he mixed it with the ingredient that made man. Sand, dirt. And he brought it together and put it in the eye, which, which is the most undesirable thing to put in a person's eye. So unsanitary and so abrasive. You put it in somebody's eye. What's wrong with you, Jesus? Are you, are you mad? Do you have a problem? Do you want to shame this person to that extent? Why would you do such a thing? But he put it in that person's eye, wanting that person to realize where man brings shame where man brings you down to dirt level when man cursed you because you're unsightly because you are undesirable people gives you a hopelessness I am going to use that same thing the same ingredient I am going to bring healing to your soul I'm going to bring healing to your soul. Wherever people look at that and say, that is shameful, Jesus says, that is beautiful. When somebody looks at that and say, that is, that is the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen, and Jesus is going to say, that's the most glorious thing I'm going to create out of you. Do you understand? The, the sand represents the recreation that God took the shame of man, he recreated the eye of this person, recreated that person so that person was able to see. Every injury, God can make it into a mission. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Oh, I, I believe so many missions out of somebody's injury. Someone's hurt, someone's shame. And they made it into a mission for their life. That's glorious. That's how God works. See, He takes the injury of man and makes it into a mission. So go, go, wash it off. Wash off the shame. Leave behind a brand new creation. Wash it off. So the man went and washed and came home seeing the struggle of his heart. Quite an experience, huh? And this is the result of the story. Verse 8 and 9, let's go look at that. His neighbors, look at this. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man. How can you declare who you are when all, everybody, all they see is what you are on the outside? Nobody sees you as you are. All they see is what they want to see. They look at you as a label sometimes because that's what you are. You're a postman because that's what you do. Your job defines who you are. You're a manager. You're a director. You're a salesperson. That's what you are. That's all they see. But you know, God give this man a new identity that he's willing to say, I am that man. <coughs> how, many, how many times has this person struggled, this blind man struggles, I don't want to be this man. I don't want to be this blind beggar. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be this person. I want to be a different person. How many times have we prayed that prayer? Can I be someone else? I like Josh. Can I be Josh? Can I be like Bala? You know, he has a beautiful head. Can, can I be like him? You know, why? can I be like Thomas? You know, it's like, we want to be someone else sometimes. But when this man, a blind beggar, 
finally got to see he wanted to be that same person that he was before he was healed. He said, I am that man, but I want you to know I'm different now. I'm different. I'm still the same man. Same man, but different. So what is mission? Mission is live out a transformed life. Not a different kind of life, but a transformed life. That's what the testimony is all about. And that's what we find in the next verse. In verse 10 and through 12, it says, How then were your eyes open? People want to know how. People want to know how it happened, they asked him. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he, he said. Yeah, I don't know how he did it. I don't even know where he's at. I don't know who he is. I just know his name is Jesus. And he put, he made mud putty. He didn't say it was saliva. He didn't say it was a spit. He skipped that part because he no longer treat that as shame. See? He sees it. Somebody made mud put, uh, putty and put it in my eye. And told me to go and wash this is mission, a life as a witness to God's goodness. People want to know how healing happens. People want to know where is Jesus. But I want to tell you, it's who you are. That's a testimony. The testimony is who you are. Before Christ and after Christ. And that's what we teach people when they're preparing for their testimony. It's like, just share about what happened before. <laughs> And what happened? And what happened afterwards? That's all you have to say. That's it. My life is a testimony. It's a witness of God. Because God wants to take every condition and put himself in it to display himself. And that's why God created man. We are supposed to be bringing him glory. And that's why we allow ourselves to be transformed by the Almighty every day we're a testament of that glorious creation and recreation of lives. Amen.